Good morning again. We, we gather, as we do every Sunday, is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It just so happens that this is the special celebration of his resurrection, of his life after death, leaving the tomb. I'm reminded of the story, kind of a funny story, uh, about a boss who asked his employee as he came into work one morning, do you believe in life after death? To which the employee said, well, yes, I do, very much so. He said, oh, that explains everything. Because yesterday when you left early to go to your grandmother's funeral, after you left, she came here to visit you. <laughs> you just got to watch those excuses. <laughs> what do you believe about life after death? about this event that we celebrate today. My hope and prayer is that you'll make a new discovery. Wherever you are on the path of faith or non-faith, that you'll make a new discovery. That's really what we find in the text I want to share with you today. It's a text about two guys, one that we're familiar with, one we're not so familiar with. A guy named Peter. A lot of everyone's heard of Peter. And then there's a guy named Cornelius. It's interesting because as Peter shares the story of Jesus, what he did in his death, his resurrection... He is discovering something new. Although he's the leader of the church and he is a man grounded in faith, he discovers through a dream that this is not just good news for the Jews alone. Up to that point, he had thought that was the case. It was just for a sect of people. But God tells him, no, it's for all people, including the Gentiles, the other half of the world. At the same time, God speaks to this Gentile Roman soldier, a centurion named Cornelius. And he instructs him through a vision that this guy Peter, a Jew, is going to come and tell him the good news of Cornelius' inclusion. And through him, for the first time, the inclusion of all the Gentiles and of all people to this good news. So Peter arrives at a fresh conviction that this is news for everyone, not just for some. And he shares it. And they all lap up this new discovery. They all make new discoveries. Listen now to this text in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who hears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. He's preaching to Cornelius here. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to all people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. My friends, the grass does wither and the flowers will always fade. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. For your word, for your grace, for your life, your new life in our midst, we give you thanks and praise, O God. Speak to us. Come to us, O Jesus, in this time as we worship you. Amen. Well, I spoke to you about a few discoveries of Peter and Cornelius. I, I want to share a couple of interesting discoveries that we have come upon in the world of science and social science that might interest you. Uh, you you've watched the Discovery Channel. On Discovery News, they have reported that, in fact, religious people are happier. Religious people are happier. 
Religious people tend to report more life satisfaction, says Discovery News. It's not their spirituality. It's not their belief in heaven. Or even the ritual act of praying or going to the house of worship that leads the pious to happiness. What is it, they say, is close friends people gain through their religions that make a difference. Listen to this statistic. 28% of people who go to services weekly, underscore that, weekly, will say they are extremely satisfied, extremely satisfied with their lives, compared to less than 20% of people who never go to a place of worship. Religion makes people happier. Religious people are happier. Another interesting uh, discovery that was made, some scientists were trying to find a way to mitigate the experience of pain. They had two groups. They drew these two groups together, and they did what's called the ice bucket test. They asked one group to immerse their hand deeply into a bucket of ice and to say or do nothing. Say or do nothing. The second group, by contrast, they asked them to immerse their hand in the same 41 degree ice water, very, very cold, but their instructions were to cuss as much and as loud as possible to see if that actually helped them endure the pain and stay in the ice longer. To their great surprise, they found that those who cussed actually endured the pain and stayed in the bucket of ice longer. Interesting discoveries, aren't they? <laughs> and that's your Easter sermon. Now, the moral of the stories, the moral of the stories are these. Be religious and cuss a lot. You'll be happier and in less pain. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Sometimes I, it's sad that I have to say I'm kidding to some people, but I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> maybe you've hit your, your, your thumb with a hammer and you know what we're talking about. Sometimes what you suspect actually is confirmed, right? We go, I thought that was true. I thought that was true. There's a reason I suspected that. Science helps us with that. And Easter faith does too. Easter, that's why you're here. Cornelius. Peter comes to him and Cornelius is saying, I thought we were in the game with you guys. I thought this good news was for us too. And he's making this great new discovery. And that's the opportunity, not only for him, but for all of us. But here's a problem. Big problem for us. Speaking to myself, as, as much as anyone, all of us. Sometimes it's just not so new. The longer you are in church, the longer you go to church and you believe in Christ, you run the risk of being inoculated against the joy inoculated against the true power, the purpose, and the meaning, inoculated against the impact, the transformational, life-changing news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so you come to Easter worship, and you listen to a sermon, and you yawn and say, when are we going to lunch? And if you have that thought, then you've been inoculated at any point. And not just on this day, but on every day. Sunday, on every day. It is life changing. If the resurrection, if the empty cross and the empty tomb, if that is true, it is life defining. It sets the trajectory for your life. It is the discovery of discoveries. It is the headline news. Anybody ever watch CNN? Do you know when you watch CNN, everything is headline news? It dilutes the meaning of headline news because whatever the news of the moment is, is headline news. This is the headline news under which all news resides. Easter truth, the discovery of discoveries, the headline news of your life and mine, of this world. If it's true, if it's true, then the living Christ is here now. If it's true. He's here to open your eyes to a new vision of truth and goodness and grace. The living Christ is here now to direct your feet to a new direction. Regardless of where you are in your, your, your walk with Christ, however long or short it's been, there is a new path, a new direction. The resurrected Christ offers you a new path of discovery. That's the truth. 
Jesus left the tomb to conquer sin, to conquer Satan. In other words, to conquer all the dead ends that would keep us from going down a new path in life with him. To open our path with God. I'm reminded of the story. It comes out of Africa. It was one of the Muslim countries in Africa. And amongst his peers, one guy was converted to Christianity. His friends asked him why he chose to become a Christian. And he answered their question with a question. He said this, true story. He said, suppose you're walking down a road and you come to a fork in the road and you don't know which way to go. And down one path, at the beginning of one path, there was a dead man. At the beginning of the other path is a man who is alive. Which one would you ask which way to go? <laughs> That's how he answered their question. Great point. You know, sadly, in my experience as a pastor, it often takes a crisis for people to head down that new path with the living Lord. I was talking about this with our, our Bible study group, Disciple Cafe. In my 25 years of doing this, I could count on one hand the number of times someone has come into my office and sat down and said, Tim, you know, I really... Nothing's wrong in my life. Everything's great. But I want, to, I want to be more in tune with Jesus Christ. I want to know God's will. I want to align my life with the life of God. I want to hear the voice of God, my purpose, my direction, meaning in my life. I want to come alive in the living Christ. I want the Spirit of God to be in me in a new way. Help me down that new path. No one does that. You know when they come to me? When they're in crisis. When they're in crisis. When the marriage falls apart, when someone dies, when they've lost the job, when the cancer diagnosis has come, when things begin to fall apart, then they're open to the living Lord and a new path. Don't wait. Don't wait for that. You know, Jesus came for us so that we might encounter him. And in that encounter, in that living encounter, we would be changed. We would know our need in a way that we never knew it before we got to a crisis. I love the way Peter Rollins talks about this as an analogy. He says this in his wonderful writings. This idea is analogous to someone who feels perfectly happy without a partner content in his or her life and work, but who eventually comes across someone with whom they fall in love. Here, the individual does not enter into the relationship out of need, but out of love, and in the midst of it is able to claim, I never needed you until now. It is in the presence of the other, not in the other's absence, that a need is formed. In the other, the need is born rather than abolished. Here we discover that the need that is born in love and faith is a retroactive need that comes after the encounter. That is the opportunity for us in the encounter with Christ out of love and faith for our need to be revealed. And so Peter comes to Cornelius and he's explaining this to him. He's opening this pathway and he does this by basically showing five major steps. Remember the old game, Mother May I? And you take the big giant step. He's five big God May I steps that led to this event and this encounter with Jesus Christ. And here's how he outlines it. God used Israel to begin the salvation message. That whole Old Testament story is God's way of setting the foundation, laying the footwork for all that is to come. And then he sends Jesus. God anointed Jesus as the Lord, as the peace giver, as Messiah and as Savior. Jesus, he says, had the power of the Holy Spirit. And he went about doing good and healing when he walked on this earth. He died according to the Old Testament prophecy. And he, he, he sits as the judge of the living and the dead. And he redeems us. And then the final and most important point of all. And it all leads up to this. Jesus lives a new life now. A resurrected life. You see, so much of Peter's gospel message, all of these steps are so important, but you know what? They all rise or fall based on the truth of Christ's new life. If it's not true, then none of it is worth anything. None of it is worth anything. 
and, and remember, this, this whole resurrection business of Jesus is not re resuscitation of life. This is not like CPR. This is not like it was with Lazarus, where he brought Lazarus back to the same old life that he lived. Lazarus had to die again. Jesus comes back to a new state of life, a new state of being. So much so that when Mary goes to touch him after he's resurrected, he says, no, no, you can't touch me. He's, he's not the earthly form, but he's not ascended to heaven. In John chapter 20, it says, Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Something new happened to Jesus. Something new happened to Mary and to Peter and to Cornelius. And it spread, not as a legend to be fond of, but as a new path, a new experience to discover for them and guess what? For you and for me too. That is our opportunity today. At Easter, we're reminded, as you look at that cross, we're reminded that the empty tomb, like the empty cross, is a symbol of Jesus' new life. The emptiness of it. The reason why Protestants don't have a crucifix with Jesus hanging on it is because the final word is the empty tomb and the empty cross. The emptiness says it all about new life. I'm reminded of the story of a little boy named Philip. He was a third grader. It was Easter Sunday. He was in Sunday school. And the teacher, she had this wonderful little activity for them. Ladies, you remember the old legs, eggs that pantyhose came in? She brought in lots of little legs, eggs, without the pantyhose, gave them out to her class. And this was the assignment. She said, children, we're going to go outside and I want you to fill the space in this egg, leg, with something that is a symbol of new life. So they go out, they do their assignment. They all come in, they place all their eggs in a little pyramid and they're kind of everywhere. And the teacher goes through them one by one. She opens it up. Oh, a leaf! How sweet. That's new life. Yes. Opens another one. A flower. Yes. New life. Opens another one. She's surprised. A butterfly flies out. Oh, fun. She goes around. She gets to one. Opens it and there's nothing. And one of the kids protests. Hey, somebody didn't do their assignment. No fair. No fair. Little Philip. By the way, I forgot to tell you, Philip had Down syndrome. And so little... Philip said, it's mine. And I did so do the assignment. It's empty. The tomb was empty. Hmm. It wasn't long after that, that little Philip developed an infection in his body that most kids could overcome, but because of his physical stature, he couldn't, and he, he died. At his funeral... All the kids in his third grade Sunday school class came forward with empty eggs and placed them on the communion table. It's a symbol of new life. Philip's new life. But it's not just life after life. It's life here and now. That's the good news. Eternal life starts here and now. The bottom line is because Jesus was given new life, you are too. We are too. The empty tomb is God. God's love busting you out of anything that would keep you settled in the old life, the life that you alone can create. That's why in John, 1 John chapter 4, he writes these wonderful words. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That we might live through him through him. That's the opportunity for us. The way of the empty tomb is your way to new life. That you might live through him beginning now. The tomb is empty because Jesus didn't stay dead. It's empty because he's alive. He is here. He's in our presence. Little boy was playing with his mother's broom outside during the day. Left it out there. And in the evening, the sun dropped. It grew dark. His mother needed to do some cleaning. She asked where the broom was. He said, oh, Mommy, I left it outside. She said, would you please go get it? He said, but Mommy, I'm, I'm afraid of the dark. She said, honey, 
Don't worry. The Lord is out there. You'll be okay. So he goes to the door. He cracks it open. And he speaks, Lord, if you're out there, please hand me the broom. <laughs> you know, she was right. She was right. Jesus Christ is out there. He's here. And we don't have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to fear anything. As the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright has said, the empty tomb is your passport to meeting Jesus today. He is alive. He is risen. By His Spirit, He is present. And He offers you a surprising and healing meeting with Himself. Think about that image of a passport. You can't give yourself a passport, can you? And, and, and when you are given a passport by someone else, it opens up a door to new discoveries, to new experiences, to new encounters, to new possibilities and places. The key is you can't stamp your own passport. You have to go there, encounter someone else who does it for you. You must travel there to have it stamped. You can't do it yourself. Our problem, part of our problem, is that we try to do it ourselves spiritually. We try to conjure up our own way of being spiritual. Stamp our own passport. Create our own path. Our own experience. Our own discoveries. Our own life. And Jesus says, don't settle for that. Don't settle for that. He left the cross and he left the tomb so that we would not settle for less than his best for us. That's the good news of the resurrected Jesus this day. As Christ was given new life, so your life is being regenerated again and again. A new path is being opened. The promise of the empty tomb is this. Just as Jesus left behind death, you can also leave behind all that is deadening in your life and go down a new path. What's deadening in your life? We all have different answers to that. Some of us have fears. Some of us have regrets. Some of us have wounds in relationships. Some of us have inhibitions. Some of us are simply apathetic and, as I said in the beginning, inoculated against anything good, including this good news. The opportunity of the empty tomb is new life with God, new life with Christ, that you might live with Him. Reminded of... Uh, the story of Carl Sagan. We all heard of Carl Sagan, the famous scientist. He talks about this biology exam. And one of the, the teachers asked his students to answer this one question. If you were to go to Mars to try and discern if there was life on Mars, what is one instrument that you would take from our laboratory? One student answered the question this way. I would simply ask the inhabitants... Even if there was a negative answer, it would be significant. <laughs> Think about that. He got an A. <laughs> Do you want the life that God promised you, for which you were created, for which Jesus died on that cross? Ask him for it. Ask him for it. Ask the author and the creator of life who also inhabits this world, who inhabits this space, who wants to inhabit your heart, your life, every step of the way, opening a new path. Don't settle for the life that you can create for yourself. Because here's the average life that you will create for yourself. The average lifespan of 70 years goes like this. You'll sleep for 23 years. You'll work for 16 years. You'll be in three years of business meetings. Isn't that horrible? You'll watch TV for eight years. You will eat for six years. You'll travel for six years. You'll be ill for four years. And you will dress for two years. That might be a little longer for ladies. I don't know. But. <laughs> or here's another way of framing it. Someone has said there are seven stages to the life of mankind. And it goes like this. Spills, drills, thrills, bills, ills, pills, and wills. <laughs> Is that... Is, is, is that all that we'll settle for? Because that's really life according to us. Jesus left the tomb to give you more than that. Listen, the new, the new life Christ has for you is infinitely better than the life you have for you. There's really only one of two ways to live life. And interestingly enough, William Shakespeare told us about that 
as we discern not only how to live new life, but as we can discern plays and movies. Remember how he said you can determine what kind of play or movie it is? It's either a comedy or a tragedy. You can think about uh, Romeo and Juliet as a tragedy. You can think about Much Ado, Much Ado About Nothing as a comedy. And there always comes a point in a play or in a movie or in a life, that crucial moment where you discover which direction it's going. Really good movies keep you holding on. You don't know which direction it's going. That moment is called the crux, right? The crux of the moment. The crux. That central, crucial moment. We use that term, the crux of the matter, to illustrate the main point, to, to illustrate the moral of the story, what really matters, that aha discovery. We use that. Crux. You know what crux means? It's Latin for the cross. The cross. We discover God's love. God's purpose for us at the crux of history in Jesus Christ on the cross, empty and on the, in, in the empty tomb. Though life, friends, can seem so tragic, and we can point to all kinds of illustrations, what we see and know and are promised in the empty cross and the empty tomb is that life is actually a comedy in Jesus Christ. Do you know why? God has the last laugh. He went to hell to defeat sin and Satan and hell and death and all that would be a dead end in order to open up a new path and God has the last laugh. And guess what that means? It means you do too. That's our opportunity as we encounter the living Lord. As you and I once again discover life in Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, we come before you. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the living Lord in our midst. Through the power of your Spirit, through the ordaining of your Father, you were raised to new life so that we might worship you and not just think back about you. We thank you for meeting us where we are. Take us down a new path, a new encounter with you. This day and every day we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words. We stand, we stand in awe of you. You are the risen Savior, our teacher, our friend, our redeemer. Eternal life is in us now through your spirit. We praise you in humble adoration and ask you to transform us by your love. We lift up this morning, Lord, the needs of our congregation and our world to you this morning. Father, we lift up Barbara McClurkin facing surgery this week. We lift up Mike Bursick to you, Lord. Father, we lift up Tom Brindle to you, recovering from surgery. We lift up Harry White to you in rehab, learning to walk again. We lift up Jean Spots to you, Lord, who needs your, your healing touch. And Father, we lift up those Christians massacred in Kenya to you. We pray, Lord, for the needs of our congregation. We pray, Lord, for the needs of our world. We ask, Father, for your intervention. We pray, Lord, we thank you for Barbara and Ken this morning, our uh, missionaries in Haiti. We pray for our families who are with us. We thank you for them this morning, Lord. And we pray for our families who are with us, Lord, in spirit. We pray, Lord, for your church around the world and all who celebrate you this morning. Unite us now, Lord, in the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please stand as